Welcome back. Over the last two decades, a reinvigorated Europe has underlined the principles of its union, at least officially, in negation of its colonial and totalitarian past. And in the spirit of multicultural diversity and openness, it recognized its Muslim minorities, launched the Euro-Mediterranean process, and accepted the accession candidacy of its largest Muslim neighbor, Turkey. Recently, however, Europe has been backpedaling on its overtures and promises by erecting immigration barriers and buffer zones with its less prosperous neighbors, damping Ankara's chances to join the Union, and raising questions about Europe as a Christian club. Before we discuss these controversial questions, Anita McNaught reports from Istanbul and Ankara on Turkish reflections on Europe. Istanbul, Constantinople. It was always the part of Turkey the West was most comfortable with. The rest, it wasn't so sure about. For 50 years, the EU's promised Turkey a bright future in Europe. But Turkey is still not a member. The EU should stop messing us around. Even a wildly popular prime minister hasn't been able to consummate the long engagement with a wedding. The reason? Turkey is too big and Muslim and different from Europe. In Europe today, the tide's turning against Turkey. Your common position is a privileged partnership for Turkey, but not full membership. I have said for a long time that I don't think Turkey has a place in the European Union. These things European politicians are saying are really annoying us. So Turkey is holding Europe to its promises. We have a certain set of uh, agreements with the European Union, uh, and we put them all aside and then say, well, is Turkey European or not? I think that's uh, ridiculous. The irony is, Turkey's revered founding father, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, wanted a European future for his country, but his authoritarian model with its military machine has, according to the EU, held Turkey back. Turkey still scores low on international polls of human rights and freedom of speech. I think without support from the European Union, it would be very difficult for Turkey to continue with these reforms. The payoff? Turks believe they'd all get jobs in Western Europe and make good money. Now it's dawning on them, that's off the EU agenda. Is there a free movement of people? No, there's not. There's a restrictions. Is there a free movement of uh, goods? No, there's a restriction for agriculture. So Turkey is forging new alliances with its neighbors to the south and east. Turkey has a policy in the Middle East. I think this is appreciated by the Americans more than the Europeans. So let me be clear. The United States strongly supports Turkey's bid to become a member of the European Union. Turkey's increasingly Islamic identity is not only worrying some EU governments, it's creating divisions at home. What I see is a country where people's uh, political mindset is dangerously getting mixed up with their uh, religious feelings and sentiments. The counter-argument goes a European embrace is just the bold move the world needs right now. Turkey's membership will give a much, perhaps much more important signal to the rest of the world that the European Union is not a Christian club, but it's a club where membership is based on shared values, political values. There's another club too, the Energy Club. Turks now have a stake in just about every gas and oil pipeline project in the region, making Turkey indispensable to Europe. I think they need us the most. Which means the European Union has no choice but to keep Turkey on the back burner, warm but distant. Professor Garten Ash, once again, you were speaking before we went to the break about the European story. Is there a place for Turkey in the European narrative? And is there a happy ending for the story? I believe there has to be. I think this is a, a really central question. Um, for Europe to define itself as a Christian club, 
when it is the most secular and atheist continent on earth would be totally ridiculous. It would be like a football team claiming that it's a church choir. It would be absurd. And I think there is a pulling back, particularly in France and Germany. I think there is a growing reluctance. We're back to France and Germany. Um, well, uh, th uh, in, in this case, other European countries are more positive about Turkish enlargement than France and Germany are. So I think it is quite important. And I think you have to tell a double story. The first part is to say there's absolutely no reason why you cannot be a Muslim European, just as you can be a Christian European or an atheist European, so long as you accept certain fundamental universal values of a free society. The second part of the story is this. If Europe wants to be a factor in its whole wider neighborhood, if it wants its wider neighborhood to be a more civilized rather than a more impoverished and war-torn and conflict-torn place, then it has a profound strategic interest for itself in taking Turkey in. Uh, Professor Ramadan. There are contradictions in, in what we call the European story. When you have a pope saying that the roots of Europe mm. are uh, a Christian the and Greek, pope. yes, the latest pope, and saying this, uh, in the way now we are rebuilding or rethinking or reshaping our past. I'm sorry, the starting point of the whole process when it comes to Europe not being only a political uh, 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 group or uh, uh, an economic dimension, but also cultural, and we are talking about values, you know, the common values, the shared values that we are. And when it comes to our history and our memory, it's as if Islam is not there. It just, it's not the there. The historic so this narrative is, is about Christians and it's Jewish ethics. Yes, is what we are not. Is what we are against what we are not, and Islam is not part of the, the story. And I think that the narrative of Europe should also so, be so more inclusive. So, uh, Professor Ramadan, is it, is it the present European thinking is imposing itself or looking retroactively in an ideological way about its own history? Bec yes, I think that it's, it's an uh, ideological take on history because we are scared of the current Muslim presence on not only Turkey, by the way, it's also in our societies that we have now millions yeah. of Muslims I, I being wanna, part of Europe. I want to read something for you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Zizek. This is the French President Sarkozy. He's, he writes the following. Turkey's entry would kill the very idea of European integration. It would permanently bury the goal of EU as a global power of common policies and of European democracy. It would be a fatal blow to the very notion of European identity. This is the French president. If we define Europe only as a kind of a, I don't know, for some kind of a successful market economy with a social welfare aspect and democracy and so on, then, then, then I don't know why cannot Chile become part of Europe. Anyone can become then in principle part of Europe. Professor Gatanas thinks Canada would be a permanent Canada. member. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> more European than more many, than Turkey, than many European it. countries. So my problem is we should nonetheless be clear about something that, that uh, to be very brutal, there, I claim there is no pure, simple multiculturalism where you say, okay, anyone can come in who respects the Correct. rules, you know? Correct. There is always some kind of a higher level which tells you how you treat this plurality of cultures. But my question to you, Professor, yes. is Moldova or Bulgaria or Romania more European no. than Turkey, for example? No, no, but I would uh, say uh, something yes. else. Yes, yes. 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 yes, they are. This is I about mean, the narrative. Moldova, <laughs> I have my problems. But, okay, no, what I would have said is that... Uh, let's, just, take, let's take another... You just insulted the whole Moldovan nation. No, just because you say it's not European? I always claimed openly that the only way to be really non-racist today is to be universally racist, to insult <laughs> everyone. <laughs> okay, now I will try to play the devil's advocate and try to imagine uh, right-wingers, or ni not even right-wingers, liberals' anxieties about Turkey. For example, when I say I don't only to have this plurality of cultures and so on and so on, I want to have a certain right to criticize, ironically, Absolutely. all religions. Absolutely. I want to have the right, now this comes crucial, not to be tolerated only as an atheist, which I am, but to be fully right. respected for what I am as an atheist. This can cause, I think, I'm not now but even talking specifically about, uh, uh, about are, Islam are, these fundamentalism. Are, yeah, yeah. There are much worse ones. I mean, you are so right, so that, but, so, so that I so hope we can all agree that free speech yeah. is a core essential of what we're about in Europe, so that 
in Turkey at the moment, if you say that what happened to the Armenians <laughs> during the First World War was a yes. genocide, you will be prosecuted. You cannot be a member of this community. Yeah. It's something like that. that. What's worse but, is but that the French parliament legislates people not that, saying things about that. And that is equally bad. What? I am against yes, all yeah, yeah, laws. Yeah. Yeah. And what is source for the goose is source for the gander. You cannot say, we will protect what is sacred to us, namely the memory yeah. of the Holocaust, which is sacred to me. Oh. But what happens to you? You have to go one way yeah. or the other. I am in fa favor of going in the direction of free speech to but call Timothy, across the Timothy, board. I just one point on that. Just one point on that, because I, I completely agree with you. But the point is, <laughs> the point, no, no, there is no part. There is just the point. To be precise on it. No, no, to be precise on this, what we heard from President Sarkozy is not about rules and principles, because we may agree on this. It's about Turkey per se, culturally and religiously, cannot enter because of Islam. This is the point. You know, Absolutely. implicitly, this is the point. The point is Islam is the problem. The second is that if we look at what happened in Turkey during over the last 20 years, they are changing, moving, and coming close, very close to the rules. But we don't talk about this. It's just, once again, the Christian club is about culture, is, and in fact, implicitly, is sending a message to all the uh, Muslim Europeans you were uh, talking about. Uh, please please ho hold on to this idea, because it seems that Europe's problem is not only Turkey, but also within Europe. And we're going to look at how some radical nationalists in Europe view this whole Muslim problem. <laughs> Europe is a rich tapestry of peoples, places, and cultures working together in harmony for the common good. But many so-called nationalists within Europe are now concerned that shared success has come at the expense of national identity and sovereignty. This Tower of Babel could only be built upon the ruins of nations. The European Union is itself essentially fascist. The British values, British traditions are based on Magna Carta, on very ancient rules of English law, and these are being systematically done away with by a European federal superstate, which is very close to fascism. We don't want the immigrants here because they are danger for the security of the Italian people. I want a revolution against illegal immigrants. I want zero tolerance. I'm against Islamic fundamentalism in particular. It's spreading more and more in Europe. Take one prime minister of Turkey who said, our minarets are our bayonets, our domes are helmets, our mosques, our barracks, our believers, our soldiers. I have a problem with the Islamization of our societies. I have a problem with the Islamic ideology, the Islamic culture, because I believe that our culture, which is based on humanism, on Christianity, on Judaism, is indeed better than the Islamic culture. Professor Gartanash, you were talking about Europe and its freedom of expression. What do you think about this freedom of expression? I, if what they were saying there is abhorrent to me, and I will defend to the death their right to say it. It's the way we learn to live together in diversity with these very different cultures and faiths and attitudes we have in Europe is to talk about our differences, yes. not mm. to but say, but you respect my taboo, yeah. I'll respect yours. That's quite the but wrong Professor way. Professor yeah. what troubles me is that this sort of um, expression, if you will, it does echo in, in, in very strange way some of the stuff I've been reading from President Sarkozy. I mean, there's an environment that is not friendly to its Muslim citizens, to its Muslim neighbors, and as it engages in neo-colonial wars in the greater Islamic world, it creates a big problem, and it's all part of one same approach. Here, I would like uh, to make a point about those uh, disgusting creatures that we saw, and I also think, uh, uh, basically, to be blunt, and I follow here my friend Alain Badiou, he calls Sarkozy Ratman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this evil seducer from fairy tales who plays a flute at the Pied Piper of the yeah, 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 yeah. You know, are we aware of something? When we see disgusting things like the ones that we just saw on that report about uh, uh, nationalism, the way to fight this is not through prohibitions. If we lose the battle at the level of, how should I call it naively, what keeps together a society, especially if it's a society of free individuals. This society needs even more than others a kind of a invisible, thick 
background of rules, civility, and so on. So I'm not afraid of that, in so far as guys like that, how to put it, automatically disqualify themselves. You know what I mean? That they are not taken, yeah. the moment they will be taken seriously, no oppressive measures will help. I think what you have is a problem of xenophobia, which, for example, in Eastern Europe, as Slava Zizek knows very well, goes particularly against the gypsies. It's nothing that's to the do great with majority, Islam. That's true. Yes. Mm. In this country and in France, in my view, it's mainly directed against immigrants as mm. such, and it's racism. Yeah. This is very true. Well, this is very true. Yeah. 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 Professor Ramadan, to, to confront you. Mo Mo yeah. Muslim yeah. only symbolize yeah. the yeah. bigger problem yeah. in Europe vis vis-a-vis the other. Take even Italy. You know who is now the big enemy? No longer immigrants, for some mysterious reasons, gypsies and Romanians. Don't ask me why. Romanians are now the figure of evil there. So I think uh, it is yeah. often yeah. anti-Islamic, but it is this general uh, xenophobic logic as a part of unresolved problems and of and globalization. And Muslims and Islam symbolizes that? Yes. You speak about, you know, Italy, but we can speak about Spain, we can speak about the, the yeah, Netherlands. Italy is the the, lowest the, the, ma the main Europe, thing is the perception that Islam is the religion of the other, is the religion, is the, we are still connecting Islam with immigration, and this is why it's Turkey is the other. The Muslims from within, the Muslim Europeans, are perceived as the other. We are all against what we heard here, but the problem is not the rise of these parties, is the normalization of what they are saying in in speeches like the, those of Sarkozy, sometimes making it clear. But not only, you know, I heard from people who are very scared of get builders in the Netherlands. Things that are very scary about the fact that they are perceiving Muslims still as the other. So I would say yes, it's about immigrations, but the connection no, but Islam uh, and immigration is a reality. The, 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 the president of the European Council, Mr. Herman Van Rampoy, was elected. Many claim specifically because he's against the very know, membership nonsense. of that's Turkey complete nonsense. in the he Union. He was elected because he's a Belgian mouse and he'll <laughs> shut up and be a nice. But he is against the Turkish <laughs> membership in the Union. It's a weak, that, it's a weak but, um, chairman. He's a, he's, a, he's a chair. No, 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 that's <laughs> nonsense. It, what we're warning against is any discourse which says Islam yeah, is yeah. this, but which also says Europe is that. Now, I would want to say that there are very serious problems with respect to human rights and free speech in most Muslim majority countries and, and inside many Muslim communities in Europe. I think that's a fact. But I, I refuse to say that that is a necessary feature of Islam. Exactly. I would like to go back to the geopolitics of Europe. As Europe builds itself into a major world power, and as Merkel, Sarkozy, and Rampoy, for example, oppose Turkish membership in the Union, is Islam and Muslims becoming the other that allows Europe to erect 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall a new sorts of walls within and around Europe in order to identify with this unique type of a superpower? I really do not think that is the new story that Europe is telling itself. If anything, now the other is maybe China more than Islam. I think we need ourselves to be very clear that it's not Islam as such which is the problem, any more than it's Christianity as such with, which is the problem with, with uh, extremist fundamentalists. But we also need Muslim Europeans to be much, much clearer, much, much more vocal in saying, as Muslim Europeans, we believe in free speech, we believe in equal rights for women, we believe in the basic freedoms of a free society. You certainly have a book about that. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, yes, and, and the last one, what I believe is exactly going that direction by saying exactly that uh, this is a, there, there's a responsibility uh, uh, for the Muslims to be quite clear on all this. But I think that if we rely on facts and figures, they are abiding by the law, they speak the language of the country, they so are abiding by the country. Because we are, because themselves. I think it's a transitory period. We need still two generations to go mm -hmm. beyond this. And I think that what you are saying to project a common narrative is something that is also our responsibility to be able to speak as we. This is what we want together. And I think that uh, the future is uh, we cannot avoid this pluralistic future. So we have to build it, and we have to be to share our responsibility as well as we share our values. Uh, Last word for you. Uh, first, I agree with this point. I think one shouldn't, I agree with you, exaggerate this duality. If anything, why not take a positive view at this uh, problems where it may appear as if Islam is the other? 
I think this is just a negative way to take into account, to admit to all of us that, my God, that we are bound together for economic and other reasons. We are, by we, I mean Europeans and the Middle East Muslims, we have a common fate. We are thrown together. Professor Zizek, on this incredibly positive <laughs> note, don't <laughs> exaggerate. Thank you so much for your positive note. And uh, I'm going to be coming back with our last uh, thoughts. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. This week's news gave new meaning to the concept of political football. As politics united Europe more than ever before, football underlined the continent and indeed the world's competing national and tribal identities. Egypt and Algeria's tensions, case in point. But while Europe was shaken by Thierry Henry's use of his hand to help his team score against Ireland, the not so invisible hand of his president, Nicolas Sarkozy, to install Herman Van Rompuy as European Council president invoked little outcry. It is odd that handling a ball provokes so much controversy, while French-German mishandling of the European democratic process goes unquestioned. The football referee might not have seen the foul play, but Europe's political elites have no excuse. Like the majority of the French, and I suspect Europeans, an apologetic Thierry Henry called for a replay, but not the French president, who opposed giving depressed and flooded Ireland a chance to a fair game. No wonder referring to football as a political game is the ultimate insult in sports. And that's the way it goes. Make sure you write me to empire at aljazeera.net with your suggestions and thoughts. Thank you for watching.